time Bill was asking about was asking about what's the effect of an arrow package, right? So, so in a similar way to um, so, so in a similar way that drag we can relate the drag on the car to the density, a drag coefficient, a frontal area, and a velocity squared. They do the same thing for lift. And you basically have negative lift. I mean, you can think about the car as basically, ideally it's an upside down airfoil. So the force of lift is gonna be, don't forget to silence yourself, Calvin. Okay. Equal to coefficient of lift times the frontal area times the velocity squared, right? So, so, and so for a, uh, like Formula One, the people who are the best in the business, they're, a lot of people, what they care about is their um, lift to drag ratio, which is basically the ratio of these two things, right? So the best in the business can get about 2.5. And it's actually, you know, this drag coefficient's maybe around one. So you, you actually, you up your drag coefficient in order to get a good negative lift coefficient. I mean, so this is probably actually a, a negative number. Um, so what I basically did is I went ahead, I don't know if you can see this, yeah. but I, I plotted, I plotted, uh, the CL with 2.5 best, in, you know, if you were as good as Formula One, what was, what is our area and the density of air? And I plotted what would the downforce be as a function of velocity, basically. And so we can basically see that how much downforce we can generate is a function of how fast we go. Right. right. Um, and you can kind of see that, you know, even our car weighs, our car already has 600 pounds of downforce. It weighs 600 pounds, right? So even just to increase it by 10%, maybe another 60 pounds, so we have to do 60% better, we need to be traveling, let's see here. So that's 50 downforce. We need to be traveling over 30 miles per hour just to get a 10% benefit in downforce. And that comes probably at a price of added drag. And that's if we were as good as Formula One. So if we're realistic here, and let's say, let's say realistically we can get a lift coefficient of 1.5, you know, um, which is probably good for a student. To get to 60, 10 per, to get 10% more down for us, we need to be going 40 miles per hour, which we're not oh, doing, right? Very often on this on this course, right? Most of the time. Oh. So, so I think that can give us, I mean, so I think that'll give us a, and we're going to pay, a, I'm not including here the price of putting airfoils and stuff, right? They add drag. So we also pay a drag penalty the entire way around the track when we do this. So it's not, it's not taking that into account either. Mm -hmm. So, so I don't know, that's, I think that's kind of a, so my instinct is if you're driving under 50 miles per hour in a 600 pound car, you might get, you could maybe, you know, if you're operating between 40 and 50, maybe you got some bang, but if we're operating below 35, most of the time in the turns, we're not getting really any bang for our buck there. Um, is my, but I mean, you could see if, if you're going, if you're going, if you're going, you know, hundreds of miles per hour. So let's open this up. So, you know, so if you're going, you know, hundreds of miles per hour, you can literally get thousands of pounds of downforce basically. Right. So, so if you can take, if you can take high speed turns, this can, it can do something, but I, I don't see it for us. Is my is my back of the envelope calculation? So so last time I guess just kind of a little a little summary.
right? We kind of identified, we mostly did straight line stuff last time, right? And so we said, where's the case where we were traction limited? At our, the best acceleration we could get was these basically kind of coefficients of friction, normalized forces in the X direction times the downwards force in the rear, right? That's our normal force in the rear. And we said our normal force in the rear, so we were kind of, we were drawing this diagram quite a bit, right? So we had this <coughs> CG. And this had some length to the CG. We said our car has a wheelbase. This is in the side view. This has some height of the CG here, basically, right? And so, and this had our car's weight, we say, would act at our CG. So we basically said our normal force in the rear had two components. It had a static component, which had to do with the horizontal location of the CG, basically. Um, the wheelbase minus the CG uh, times the weight over the wheelbase. Right, so if the length of the CG is zero, right, this top term is just wheelbase over, if this, sorry, one sec. If this length of the CG is, is, is zero right here, oh, I gotta do it on this computer, sorry. The length of the CG is zero right here. You just have wheelbase over wheelbase and you have all your downforces in your rear, right? And that makes sense, right? You put your CG over your rear, all your weight, is on your rear tires basically, right? But you also have a term for weight shift. So your excel however fast you're accelerating, times the height over your CG relative to G over the wheelbase times your weight. So you also get you also get you also get some added downforce in the rear. As you accelerate, your weight shifts back basically. So your weight will shift back and you'll get more downforce on your rear, right? Um, so that was our, that was our kind of traction limited, right? And we saw that these NFXs, so I think, I think, uh, Sergio has measured it for kind of try to measure it for Baja, like what's, and he, we get like 1.2. Um, and for, uh, for formula, I've gone in and I've plotted the, I took all the data for our tires. And this is this normalized longitudinal force as a function of downforce. And you can see that it gets lower and lower as your downforce, as your downforce gets higher. So the more you put on the tires, the less kind of, the lower their coefficient of friction. You can think about this as kind of like a coefficient of friction. And we're at about 200. So that means, that means if we put the whole weight of the car on the rear, we can, we can accelerate at 3.5 Gs. So you can, you know, these tires are, these are some good tires, crazy, almost crazy good tires. Um, I'm very impressed with them. But Baja, I, we've measured in the dirt, we're about one, 1 1.2 on this value, right? So there were Baja best we're doing is maybe 1.2 Gs if we put all of our weight in the rear. Um, so let's go back to our notes. So the other thing we talked about was being propulsion limited. was traction limited up here. So last time we did a free body diagram of the car and we said that our power was equal to the force on the tire times how fast we were going. And that was equal to the mass times acceleration times velocity, the coefficient of rolling resistance times the weight times the velocity plus the drag term, one half rho a front drag coefficient v squared, right? And so we we arrange this and solve for our the best acceleration we can get based on the power of our engine. We basically just subtract over all this, put it on the other side, and then divide by mv. So we'll basically get um, power minus mu rolling resistance times weight times velocity minus one half rho a front drag V squared all over. Oh, sorry, this was V cubed. V cubed uh, over MV. 
right? So that's the best acceleration you can get based on the power of your engine. It assumes you can, it, that assumes your gearing is right though, right? So um, like at low speeds, you typically do not have a high enough gear ratio that you want at really low speeds. But so, so what I've done on this next plot, so, um, so I basically did is I just, I went into Excel and I put in a couple of, a couple of values. I put in the horsepower, I multiplied it by 550 to get it in foot pounds force per second, which is for English units. That's what we like to do calculations in. Put in the weight of a car. I divide that 30 by 32.2, get the mass of the car in slugs, the English unit for mass. I put in our area, I put in the density, I guessed uh, drag coefficient, and uh, I guessed uh, rolling resistance for the car. What I did at that is I just made this velocity, converted it to miles per hour, and then I calculated what's the rolling resistance power that we're basically being, con that's being consumed basically. So that's, all that is is, um, let's go to this. That's this term right here. That's the rolling resistance power, I called it. And this is the drag, basically the, the power that's being consumed by the drag, right? So this is the power of our engine and we're losing some power to, to uh, rolling resistance and then some to aero some to drag, right? And then the, whatever is left over, that can help us accelerate basically. So, and then I, I plotted that here basically. So let me walk you through this. So we can look at the re rolling resistance power, right? And when we plot that power and horsepower versus, um, versus our speed and miles per hour, you can see it's linear, right? Cause it's a, it's, times velocity to the first power, right? So here you see it's mu r r weight times velocity. So it's just times, it's just a linear function. And you see it does not consume very much, it does not consume very much power even at, you know, it doesn't take, it doesn't take much even at 40 miles per hour to, to, uh, to get over this rolling resistance, right? Um, and then we have our, the next one is our drag power. And you see that this is a V cube term basically, right? And so this starts to get high around, you know, uh, it's gonna start kind of going V squared and pass the rolling resistance at about 35. So at about 35 miles per hour, the drag has a larger effect. Uh, it takes more power to overcome your, your aero drag than your rolling resistance. And this leftover bit, this blue line right here, that's how much acceleration you can have. That's how much power you have left to help you accelerate basically. So you can see at low speeds, you have a ton of power left in formula, right? To accelerate. And all you're limited by is your traction, right? Let's say, let's say I'm saying you can accelerate with two G's because the best you could do is about three with our tires, but you don't have all your weight in the rear. You know, you only have a fraction of it. So at low speeds, you're limited to accelerating at two G basically. And once you get up to about 15, now you're limited by what your engine, the acceleration your engine can do, right? But you still have pretty good, you still have pretty good power. Um, you still have pretty good power uh, all the way, you know, acceleration capability. So to be honest, the, the car is overpowered, I would say in this case. Like you don't need to be accelerating forward at 1G, you know, at, at these high speeds. So, um, so I mean, I think, Paying, we asked the last question, right? Should we, should we waste extra weight on the engine so we could have more power? And I think the answer is basically not really, not unless, not unless, you know, it's, we're really, for the most part, we're governed by our tires. We're not really limited by the power that our engine can put out. So, um, so I think that, so that'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so, so that's kind of like, just a little bit more of what we talked about last time. And kind of an analogy. So, um, so last time we looked at some of our tire plots, right? And we were, for the horizontal, we looked at the slip ratio, right? And we said that was because the tires, when they're spinning forward, they're not actually rotating right perfectly with the ground, right? So they're not kind of like going with the ground perfectly. 
because they're deflecting, actually the tire has to a little bit spin a little bit faster than you'd expect. And the grip you get is a function of that basically. So, um, so, but there's a similar thing that happens. There's a similar thing that happens laterally. So these are, this is the data for our tire for trying to do cornering. So, so when you go laterally, we look at something called a slip angle. So what that basically is, and you guys just stop me and ask questions. This is, I didn't really want this to be a lecture. I want it to be more of a. Chris, how, uh, when you said we're pulling two Gs when, we, when the car launches, mm -hmm. I mean, that sounds like a lot to me. I mean, I, so from say zero to, to 15 miles an hour, what would be the time on that? How, how long would it take to accelerate to 15 miles per hour? At, sir, at two Gs. At two Gs. So the, um, so the, assuming we're accelerating at a constant two Gs, the, um, the distance you travel is related to the velocity squared over two times the acceleration. Uh, so, We could, and the um, velocity is equal to the acceleration times time. So 20 miles per hour, let's say it's roughly 30 feet per second. So that tells me that the time is going to be 30 feet per second over 32 feet per second squared. So it should be on the order of one second. Will our car do that? Well, I don't know if we, it, it only, if they gear it right, right? So if they, you know, if, if they gear it like with way too low of a gear ratio and they can't spin the tires, like if you can't spin the tires, then you can't get it up to 2G. But if you can get to the point where you're losing traction with your tires, then you should be able to get, you should be able to accelerate at 2G with these tires. It's how fast it should be. Yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, formula, the, you know, so yeah. So, I mean, I think formula cars, you know, they might be pulling four Gs. I mean, they're, the drivers got to train their brains for that stuff at that point. But okay, so, um, so, so let's pretend we're doing, so let's pretend we're doing a, a right hand, a right hand turn basically. So let's say we have a tire uh, and let's say we're making a right-hand turn. So when we make a right-hand turn, I'm just going to draw it sideways. When we make a right-hand turn, our tire is going to be angled like this, right? I'm going to just look at one tire, right? And let's do a line down the center, right? Yeah. So the tire will be pointing here, but this will not be the direction at which you're traveling. Your tire, your travel will actually be you'll actually be traveling along this velocity vector, slightly different from where your tire is pointing. And so this angle here is out, we call alpha. So that's your slip ratio. And if you had a camera pointing up from the cement, looking at the tread of your tire, what it's gonna look like is you're gonna have treads that will come along here and then they're going to distort and then come back. So your, your contact patch is actually rotated on your tire, right? So it's actually rotated and it's facing along this velocity axis. So basically your contact tread will actually be rotated here. So you'll actually be like, you'll be, t you imagine almost like taking the bottom of your tire and you're torquing the bottom of your tire basically. And that's what's giving you that, that's what's giving you that torque. And so, and you build up, you build up that slip ratio basically on here. So that's this slip, sorry, slip angle, not slip ratio. Slip ratio is the other one. You build up that slip angle to reach your maximum lateral force, right? And so this is your maximum lateral force as a function of like downforce, 
uh, as a function of tire pressure. So here we can see, in terms of tire pressure for turning, 8 to 12 PSI does all about the same. It gives us this same grip, the same kind of coefficient of friction, right? If you look over here, our tires, typically you think about cam camber thrust. So in a turn, you think it's good to have a little negative camber to help you like on a right-hand turn, right? So to help you push you around. Our tires don't exhibit any camber thrust. Um, so in the way you can tell that is this inclination angle is getting bigger. So that basically means when they're doing the tire test, they're turning it sideways and they're measuring how good it's doing this turning. You see that straight up and down, our tire gets the highest grip. So there's no point of having our, our tire should almost never leave vertical. So as it travels or as the car rolls, this tire should not roll with it. We want to design the tire to sit straight up and down on that road, basically hug that road flat. Um, so I've also plotted this kind of downforce, uh, this, this grip as a function of downforce. And you see, you have the same trend as you do forward and backwards when you're turning. As you go from, as you go from, uh, as you go from higher, when you push higher down and higher down on it, your downforce goes lower and lower. And this is why you want a large track width. So we're going to go over that here in a second. You also see that you, with more downforce, you start to make that max, you start to make it at a higher slip angle. So that's, that's also um, kind of a, uh, what we're seeing with our, with our tires. Um, so if I want to draw, um, I want to draw. I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, going back to the, um, when you're looking at the angles on the tire, so let's say like you're design, <clears throat> designing a steering and like I think the max or uh, the peak amount of grip you'll get is like five degrees. That's kind of where you want to like ballpark, I guess, your design around like when you're like, okay, I'm going to turn my wheel like seven degrees at like this speed. And then like, depending on the rules, you kind of make do with what you can design for or like um, all right, so so this angle here, this slip angle, it has nothing to do with how far your tires have turned. It's it's the angle. So one one first thing first is that you make it at like five, ten degrees, like eight to ten degrees. So it's it's higher than that. Two, it actually it has to do with the relative angle between where your tire points and where it's actually traveling. So you, to turn, you better have your tires turn a lot more than 10 degrees because your tires need to point 10 degrees inside the, inside the velocity that you're going, basically. Um, your, your question about how, so what, what really becomes interesting is whether your car understeers or oversteers because what basically an, an understeering car basically means is you to do your like an so re, for a neutral steeler car the angle that you'd expect from ackerman so let's say you turned your wheel and ackerman predicted you to have a six foot turning radius if you have a neutral steer car even with these slip angles you're going to make a six foot turn basically but for like an understeer car if you turn your tires to um, if you turn your tires and you're expecting based on kind of the turn circle to get six feet, because if it's an understeer, you need to turn the tires actually a little bit more to actually achieve the six foot turn radius. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about maybe in the steering section, because that's like, that's a really involved kind of analysis to show that. But it basically stems from the fact that, so I'm going to draw so typically when we look at turning, kind of in a simple case, we use a bicycle model. Um, you can tell like pretty much all the diagrams I draw, I use two tires, you know, if it's side or top, it's just, it's too much work to draw, do analysis on four tires basically. But so during a turn, during a turn, and this will be a right turn. Your front tire will be at an angle like, like this. Let's say your back tire is fixed. Right. So this is, 
So you're making a right hand turn, but your car is pointing in this diagram, your car is pointing straight up and down, right? So the, you know, basically the back tire to the front tire points forward. So your car's heading is straight forward. So this is your car is like, it looks like it's going this direction, but we know that with this tire turned this direction, it's actually gonna have a velocity vector here. So this is the velocity of the front. It's gonna go, it's gonna go different from the slip angle from the front. Your front tire is not the only thing making turning. Your back tire. So this is the velocity of your rear. Your back tire also has your back tire also has a slip angle. So your back tire is actually traveling up and to the left, but it's pointing to the right. So it's actually so these tires are both generating generating turning force for you. So this is the force on your rear. This is the force on your front. So and this is maybe the CG of your car, right? This is the force of your front. Typically, we express when we're looking at steering, we express these as a function of cornering stiffness. So we call this C front. This is the cornering stiffness. Which is equal to the lateral force. So we usually call that FY. That's the lateral force. Um, divided by the uh, slip angle. So this gets multiplied by the slip angle. And the force in the rear, we also have a cornering stiffness times this in the rear. So both these tires make up in the rear. So when these tires get tested, CalSpan actually cares about these values. So literally, I just went online and I, they, this data is already tabulated. They give you data for the cornering stiffness of your tires. So CalSpan basically calculates this for all the tires that they're testing. So we can see, and you can see that, so this inclination angle is basically, this means your tire is straight up and down. Here, it's your tire is at two degrees, data for tire at two degrees, data for tire at four degrees. This is all at 12 PSI. So they do it at different pressures. So we can see like the cornering stiffness of our car, because we have about 200 pounds downforce is about 158. So we get about 158. So this value, so this is about 158 pounds force per degree for, for our tires. And the way they get that value is if we go into these plots basically, all it is, it's the slope of this line. So the slope of this line is your cornering stiffness. It's basically the lateral force, um, the lateral force divided by the degrees. But actually, instead of normalized, you'd plot the actual thing. So to go from the normalized to the actual thing, like this black line, since it's 50 pounds force down, you just multiply it, it'd be multiplied by 50. Um, so, um, so like uh, the typical the typical plot you'll see for these is like uh, so slip angle lateral force. So normalized they no, normally they don't plot the um, the normalized one, which I think is a little bit it's a little bit silly. It's not really comparing apples to apples, but like this plot is what they typically you know show. So you do slip angle just versus lateral force, but I think it's better just to divide this one. Since this, of course, the 8,000 pounds of downforce gets more lateral force, right? So I like to divide this, all these values by the actual load that they're seeing. But anyway, so this, it's basically the slope of, if you plotted it like this instead, it would be the slope of, slope of these, right? So, um, so, so that's, so this is your, so this is, this is kind of how your, this is kind of how your car turns basically. Um, the other thing that's interesting in here that CalSpan measures is your, the spring rate of your tire. So that's like if you treated your tire as a spring, right? So let's say you had your car's, your corner mass of your car, right? 
and you wanted to do a simulation of what, how your suspension reacted, how might you use this value? Here we go, who do we got here? We got Aaron, did we lose Enrique? Oh, we lost, how did we lose Enrique? I'll call him, just kidding. All right, so the question would be, so why would, why would you care? So this basically, this, this experiment, they push down on the tire and they just measure how much it deflects. They treat the tire like a spring. They put a hundred pounds, you know, here, this 641, they put 641 pounds on the tire and it deflects one inch. Like, why would that number ever be useful to us? When you're getting your spring rates? Yeah, it's useful when you're designing your, the, the response of your car to, um, to bumps or roll basically, right? So typically we model our, like this, maybe the simplest model of our suspension that we use is you use a K of your tire and you put the mass of your tire here and then you have your spring, you have the K of your right. spring, I can't you have your the spring. C of your dampener and then you have, oh, I'm not even showing you this, sorry. Oh, okay. So you have your ground, you have the K of your tire, the stiffness of your tire, you have the mass of your tire, you have your spring, and you have your dampener, and then you have the corner weight, your corner mass, basically. And what you do is you'd say, okay, and you'd have some deflection, Y of T, or you could have some forces, right? You could say, oh, your car is going to have to go over these bumps. And you say, okay, well, Y of my car versus maybe Y of the ground. And you say, okay, well, when the car goes over a bump, what is the driver sitting in that sitting in that field, right? And it depends. I mean, if you're in a passenger vehicle, your goal might be to reduce the acceleration your driver feels. If you're, you know, in a race car, you might care about keeping your tire as firmly on the ground as possible, right? So that's why that's why you you want this to be as small as possible in a racing car, right? You reduce you reduce any of your you know uh, unsprung mass just because it's easier to keep it on the ground, basically. So that's, so, I mean, you know, you know, they even care enough to reduce the data for us, for our own tires, basically, right? That that's, that's there. And I basically just went up there and just straight up downloaded it. So if someone wanted to actually uh, model our suspension and go, okay, how can we, you know, and we're going to talk more about suspension after we get to suspension, but how can we, you know, how could we best pick our stiffness of our springs and the stiffness and the damping of our, our dampers? You'd want to know what's the stiffness of your tire, right? Because it's also in the system. But it's good to know, I mean, this rough, some rough values, right? So you know it's on the order of five to 600 pounds per inch is the stiffness of, the stiffness of these tires, basically, right? Um, you know, you could, you could figure out what the natural frequency, for example, is. You know, when does your, when does your tire, like, when will it start to, because you know that, um, you know, your natural frequency is square root of K over M of your tire, basically. So you could, you could figure out some of this, some, so, but that should be, that should be pretty high frequency that you're start to, start to do that. So, and okay. Have you, um, have you looked around at other spring rates for other tires? Because I heard generally it's about the same. I mean, I, I would guess, I would guess a Baja tire is probably two to three times less stiff than a formula tire, for example, right? So um, it probably depends a lot on one, the, you know, it probably depends a lot on like the size and the sidewalls of the tire and that sort of thing, right? But I bet, I bet you you're right in that like, if we pick different compounds for a 10 inch tire that we're not going to see this, this thing go crazy different. I mean, we can, I just lock this. I mean, you can basically see all the different tires that the form of the tires that they have. I mean, here's a low one, right? 394. But these are all tires at different inflations. So do you think that would change? I mean, let's say your spring rate. So a lot, a lot or like slightly. What? The different tires. Like, like, is no, that value? I mean, I don't honestly, I don't think I would pick a tire based on its spring rate. I mean, I think you're going to pick it 
based on its cornering stiffness and it's like maxed it's max like normalized load right so you're i think you're gonna you're gonna pick it more based on these plots right like what's how much lateral force can it get basically you know at our 200 pounds like that's what you care about and where is it making that value i mean so okay, other stuff there, you just notice, uh -huh. um you'll kind of notice so i plot when they do these runs this is the temperature of the tires as they warm up so the left hand side this is the top plot ignore that that's more just i wanted to look at the temperatures when they did their different tests to say hey are they really comparing apples to apples are they running the tests at the same tire temps or are the tires colder in some instances than others but here you can see here's the cornering warm-ups and here's the drive brake the forward back warm-ups you can tell that the tire goes from about room temperature of 80 to about its running temperature around 130 140 and almost just over a minute when you're doing cornering but if you look at the drive brake you know even just to go to 100 to 130 it almost takes more than five minutes so it basically tells me if you want to warm up i mean it's no surprise to me that drivers when they want to warm up the tires that they sway back and forth on the track they don't accelerate and brake, accelerate and brake, accelerate and brake, right? They, they sway back and forth. And you just, I mean, you can see from maximizing the cornering of your tire, it seems like it warms it up a lot faster, right? But keep in mind, the, you know, the, they take a minute to warm up, which might be important for like a, an event like autocross because we can't use tire warmers, right? Like we liter literally have to go out there and do autocross on cold tires. It's, you know, a couple minute long thing, right? So you're basically, endurance maybe doesn't matter you probably for the most part you're running on warm tires but for but for um autocross you're probably spending only you know you're spending most of your autocross run on cold tires so using so kind of so you might want to you know pick we might want to pick tires that warm up quick you know if we want to do better in some of these other events because we're they're so short we're not and we're not allowed to use tire warmers we're running cold tires we're not running hot tires basically i think ours are on the warmer side is what i read like they warm they up pretty quick warmer? i'm sorry what you mean they have to be warmer or they warm up no. faster yeah they warm up faster than other ones or they tend to maybe it's because it's a softer compound or and then i do know that like people are saying if you're above 200 then that's when they start shredding or destroying so yeah, I mean, they're pushing these tires to their outer limit and they're reaching 130. So I would say you don't want to go go crazy. But yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd want to see the data. I mean, I don't, you know, I would never trust what people say, basically. I mean, we have the data. If we want to make decisions about it, we should do it based on the data, not what we basically hear people say, right? So, um, so I'd say, like, take all the plots and go plot the softer, harder compounds, go plot the softer compounds, see what it does, right? Um, uh, so, so let's, um, so let's, uh, so let's, let's look at what happens in a turn basically, right? So, so we look at the car, but I mean, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to cut you off, David, but, uh, um, but yeah, I mean, it's definitely something interesting to compare. And I think our tires are soft as heck. So it's not surprising to me that they warm up fast, basically. I mean, we chew up our tires, right? So it's like pretty easily. But I mean, I think that could be also like just a mess of design or like a wrong like suspension setup and like it has <coughs> wrong angle on the tire or something. And that could probably mess up our tires like our or wobbly hubs. Yeah. Uh, wobbly hubs is probably not good for several reasons. <laughs> You're probably right. All right. So if we look at our car from so in a turn, and let's do a right-hand turn. All right. So this is the track width of our car, right, right here. Um, let's see here. It's taking a second to. There you go. The track width, uh, and here's the height of our CG. Right in the back here. And then, so in our, in the turn, let's say we had, let's say we had no, let's say we had no weight shift in the turn. Basically, how fast could we go in a turn? So 
So we basically said that the car from a from like kind of a, a top down view, we can get a force laterally times the max NFY force in this case times the total normal force. And so in a in a turn, unlike going forward, we can use all four tires to make a turn, right? We can only drive forward with our with our rears. We can brake with all four, but we can we can turn with all four, right? So this term is just the total weight basically. So so our force I don't know why I call it force L. Let's just call it force on a turn. Oh, uh, yeah, force total. So our NFY for our tires. So let's assume we were doing the best we could do, basically. Um, so at about 200, that's slip ratio. So slip angle at about 200 pounds downforce, we're looking at about a normalized kind of a coefficient of friction of maybe 2.8. Right, which is actually it's plotted here, right? So 200 pounds are sitting at about 2.8. So we can go 2.8 times our times our weight, right? So that means that this is equal to the mass times our mass times our acceleration, right? So in this case, our mass is our weight over g times our acceleration. Oh, sorry guys, I keep forgetting to switch you over. So our force total, we have this was 2.8, our downforce is our weight, and that's our mass times the acceleration towards the middle, right? Because in a turn, our acceleration points to the in, points to the center point of that of that of the radius of our turn, basically. So this basically says that if we cancel out the two weights here and here, and we multiply across by g, that says our best acceleration is equal to 2.8 Gs. So that's why like looking at these plots is kind of interesting because it, it immediately tells you how much you can accelerate. It's like pretty pretty quick, right? It's just, I read 2.8, I know I can accelerate at 2.8 Gs, right? So so let's say, how fast can our, how fast can our car take maybe one of the smallest, one of the smallest turns? So what did we say that, the turning radius of a small turn was, it was about like 20, maybe like uh, 10 feet or something, right? It was tiny, the radius. Yeah, about 20 feet. Cool. Was that the radius or was that the diameter though, Enrique? Uh, diameter. So the radius was like 10 feet, right? Yeah. All right, so so how can we, how can we relate our acceleration in this case to a velocity? It's v squared over r. Yeah, it's kind of your classic centripetal acceleration, right? So centripetal acceleration is v squared over r. So in this case, where I'm going to solve for my radius, my radius, or so, oh, sorry, I'm going to solve for my velocity. Let's see how fast can I do this? So my velocity equals the square root of 2.8 g's times r, which is the root of 2.8 times 32.2 feet per second squared times 10 feet. So this is, what's the, what's this value? So I can do it real quick. Probably like 35 miles. What is it? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think you're right. It's on the order of 10 feet per second. So I'll yeah. make it 2.8 times 32.2 .2 times 10. Okay. It's 901 raised to the 0.5. Oh no, I'm wrong. 30. So here you go. So it's 901 uh, feet squared per second squared. Velocity here is 30 
feet per second. Right, and so to convert that to miles per hour, we multiply that by 0.68. It's about 20. Right, okay. so it makes it makes sense that our kind of these low speed turns we're taking them at about 20 with these tires, right? So we're we're looking at pulling about a 2.8 g turn, and with the uh, with with our car. Uh, with these small radius, we're talking about doing that at 20 miles per hour. Basically, that should be our that should be our goal for those for those turns. If you're if you're getting the tires up on their you're putting the tires up on their edge, right? I mean, not physically edge, but you're going up onto the. You want to go up on. You want to be getting your tires up onto this edge, right? You don't want to be operating down here because you got more grip to go, basically, right? So you're pushing them up onto the edge for their. If you go over this value though, then then you slip, then you slide out, right? You're getting the tires up up in this max, this max side force basically, right? So this is the maximum. All right, so so what was the big assumption, or maybe we may keep few, but what was one of the first big assumptions I made when I started to pencil this out? You're doing two Gs. At first I assumed I'm doing two Gs, but what did I assume to assume that I, to figure out that I could do two Gs? Um, you said your tires were gonna be- No weight transfer? No weight transfer, right? I assumed, I assumed I had an even 200 pounds across all my tires, right? So, well, let's see if we're doing a 2.8 G turn, what is the, what is actually the weight transfer in this case, right? So that might be an interesting question, right? So if we have a car, let's say the height of our, Enrique, what was your best guess at the height of our CG or David? Uh, 12, 12, 12. inches. Is it, and maybe a little lower in the front? Yeah. 11 and a half was the lowest. So, so let's just do 12 inches. Let's just do a round, do a round foot. The track width was, what did you guys say, 55 inches? 51. 50? 51. 51 inches was our track width, right? And this, and we're accelerating. We're accelerating in this case at uh, 2.8 Gs. And we have our weight right here, right? So our, my question is, is what is the normal force, the total normal force on our left tires? And what is the total normal force on our right tires? How much does your car weigh? Our car weight is 650 pounds. Are you assuming equal weight distribution? On the front and rear, yes. Let's see, how many people do we got in here? We got Christian, we got David, we got Frank, we got Aaron. Oh. All right. You said you had 30 on the front, right? And we had, so, so we know, we know we have 650 and we have a little bit more in the front, but I'm just going to make my car. I'm going to, I'm just more curious about how much gets shifted from the right to the left, basically. And how much of the weight that used to be on the right of the car when I'm making a right hand turn is getting shifted out to the left hand side of this car. So is it 60, 40? Well, I mean, we guessed that our weight in the rear to the front is 60-40. I mean, oh, wait, is that what we're, not, we're doing? But we're not doing front to rear, right? We're doing left to right, right? Yeah. So, so what, what do you think the approach would be here? How would we, how, how, how would we figure this thing out? Some of the moments, don't we? Yeah, we got to do some of the moments, right? Remember that trick I showed you all last time? If you draw a free body diagram and you, and you do a minus MA, so this was this was a 2.8 G's. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a minus. I'm going to put that in red. Huh. I'm going to have 
2.8 G times the mass, right? And this is oh, 700. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do, I got to do some of the moments. Let's do the sum of the moments about the right tire. Some of the moments about the right tire with this being positive is equal to zero. But I'm using this sum of the forces minus MA is equal to zero trick. Right? So it's not, it's not an equilibrium problem, but we're kind of treating it like an equilibrium problem. So what moments do I have about the right tire? None. Come on. Yeah, the no, yeah, the normal force on the right tire does not contribute. So what are the stuff that does contribute to the moments about the right tire? The weight and the normal force on the left tire. Good. So the so you got the you got the weight, and what do I multiply the weight by? What's this moment arm? Uh, uh, half the wheel base. Uh, yeah, half the track width. Perfect. So we have the track width divided by two, right? So that's that's this distance here. All right, so this is track width. Okay, and then Enrique said we also have plus our 2.8 times our weight times what's the moment arm on that? 12 inches. Yeah, it's the height of our CG. Nice, David. Height of our CG. And then what do we have? And then what do we have left? Minus NL times 51. Yeah, the normal force. Minus the left tire times our track width, basically. So let's solve for the so let's let's solve for the let's solve for the force on the left tire. So the force on the left tire, NL, is going to be equal to the weight times the track width over two, plus the 2.8. This is just the acceleration. So we have the acceleration times the weight times the height of the CG over the track width. So we'll see this cancels and this cancels. And I'm going to bring this over to here. So the force on our left tire is equal to the weight over two. Well, that's a, what case, in what case is the normal force on our left tire, the weight over two? When it's not turning? When it's not, every, anytime it's not turning. So this is the static weight distribution, right? So we found, we got the static, and then we got a term for the weight shift. So we got minus the acceleration times the weight times the height of the CG over the track width. I'm missing one term here, though. This is divided by G. If I put this 2.8 right here, this is A over G, sorry. So, so this term is the static. This term is the weight shift. And I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna pull this out. Let's just do, let's do a big W on the outside, right? This is the weight shift. That's the weight shift, right? Um, and you'll notice this looks pretty similar to when we were going forward and backwards. So we started off today's thing. We said, right, we said here, we said we had a static contribution to the rear tires, right? And that depended on forward and back, but it just happens that left and right, hopefully our CG is roughly in the middle, left and right, but it's not really in the middle front and back. And we have this um, we have this similar term right here. Of course, this term is supposed to be wheel base, not the weight. So we have the same thing here, but it depends on the track width. So so let's let's see in a two point 
So if our weight is 650 pounds, hmm. if our weight is 650 pounds force, what's the weight on our left tire? So we have NL is equal to 650 over two plus A over G was 2.8 G's, right? So it's 2.8 times 12 inches over 51 times 650. Sorry. So this was our, this is A over G right here, right? 2.8 G's, 12 inches, 51 inches, 650 pounds. If this number goes over 650, it basically means you flip the car. Right? Hmm. So you, you know what we get? Like 700, I think. I get like, I get, let's see here. I get 1,000. It basically means if we tried in this car with this little of a track width and this high of a CG, we flip, we basically flip the car over. <laughs> right? Um, so, I mean, our height of our CG we want to do 2.8 G's. Our height of our CG needs to be, uh, the track width needs to be at least 2.8 times, 2.8 times that. So it should be, let's see here, 2.8. Oh no, I messed up. Yeah. Gonna divide the 650 by two. Oh. Yeah, I got 750, sorry. So it's still, I just want to make sure I'm not missing like a, I'm not missing like a divide by two somewhere or something, right? Wait, Chris, I have a question. So, yeah. Um, so I just looked it up in the rule book. So the outside diameter of this is of like a hairpin turn is about 30 feet. Yeah. So that means our radius is 15. So are we supposed to take that to be our radius, 15? Or is I mean, it supposed this to be like... This 2.8 G's, this 2.8 mm -hmm. G's is the max our tires can do. Depend doesn't matter on the radius. Yeah, but the way that like so I like when when I I did these calculations, I I worked a little bit backwards. So and I, I was trying to find my acceleration. Um, yeah. And, and then I kind of did it. So because when I did it, saying that we did like this turn at 20 miles an hour, I got 1.8 G's. Um, so right now I'm checking, checking my math that I, that I did. Like, yeah, I'm checking my math too. This seems, this seems too high. Yeah. Let's see here. So we have the left. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I just think I just think our CG is too high to do this, right? Wait, no. So what what, I, what I'm saying is I'm like I so what I did, I said my so again I'm using that v squared over r equation. Yeah. And then I'm saying so and then for my v I put in 20 miles, which comes out to be 8.94 meters per second. And then I'm saying that my radius is going to be uh, 4.5. Um, and then I get 17.84, which is 1.8 Gs. Why so, do you assume we can only do 1.8 Gs? No, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that like, I'm not, I'm not assuming that that's like what our, the, the limit is. Yeah. Uh, I'm just saying that like, 
Um, because I think we would need to go a little bit faster for us to see 20 miles. Like, you know what I mean? Like, if we're going to be doing like almost three Gs, I assume the car has to go a little bit faster than that. Right? I mean, it doesn't matter the block. And, and so, right, the acceleration is B squared over R. So you could literally yeah. almost be going zero miles per hour, but be turning on a penny and have huge accelerations, right? Right. So oh, how are these people getting 333? So this number by itself is 325. I got 700. Yeah, it's like 750. Bachman, 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 you forgot to divide by G. Oh, that G is that G is in here. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. That's how we got that, but yeah. yeah. No, okay. so the G's the G's in here. Sorry. All right. <laughs> yeah, that's what I got. So so the lesson, the lesson here is, the lesson here is you can, if your track width is not wide enough, you can almost shift all of your weight to your outside wheels in a turn, right? It's very possible. So I guess what are the consequences of shifting all of your weight to your outside, to your outside wheels, right? So let's go back and let's look. So I looked a little bit at this data here if everybody can see it and you'll see i plotted this line right here this line is the max lateral force you can get and it gets lower and lower right so let's say so so um See, you'll see how I, see how I can do it two go two meetings at once. Hey everybody. <laughs> uh, so, um, so we're on av average around this 150 pounds of of downforce, right? So we, for at 100, you know, about 150, we're at about two point. We can corner at about 2.8 g's. So. But even distribution. Right? So that's pretty good. But as we shift from 200 pounds force to about 350 pounds force, so I'm going to continue this. So when I fitted, when I fitted, when I fitted this line, to see how much it would go if we put to about 350 pounds force. So see, we can only accelerate down to about 2.6 Gs, right? So, so if we see what's the percent difference of this. So as the weight shifts, we lose 7% of our, of our turning capability, right? So the more you let your weight shift from being around all four tires, because this downforce, because this normalized lateral force goes down, basically allowing that weight shift will decrease your total turning ability by, it can decrease it by about 10%, right? So so that'll have, um, so that'll have a, a rather, you know, big, big effect on, on, on what you can do in the turners, right? So that's why, that's why you want to keep this track width wide and the height of your CG low so that you avoid shifting weight to your outside wheels, basically. And you keep the, you can use you know, all four of your wheels to help you in a turn, basically, and not just your outside two. So this gets to a little bit of what, so we're currently working on trying to figure out what size wheelbase and what size track width that you should, we should use for our cars, basically. And I think in Bahan formula, we honestly see kind of similar trends, basically. So
So if we have our four wheels, we're kind of talking about, so, so far, I basically kind of talked a little bit about just the overall size and shape of the car and the effects on it going around the track a little bit. So, but so how does that affect our decisions about kind of the overall stuff about the vehicle, right? So, so this is our track. This is our wheelbase. That's our wheelbase is front to back. So in both, in both cases, we tend to minimize the wheelbase. Right. So we typically minimize the wheelbase close to close to the rules enough to fit, or in Baja's case, we do it enough to fit the driver and fit the engine basically. And so having the wheelbase small, one, it brings mass in towards the center, right? So having mass in the center, we haven't talked about the moment of inertia of turning your car, but having the mass all close to the middle, it's like, it's basically easier to rotate it versus having mass on the outside of your car, having to rotate it takes a lot more. We haven't talked really about the moment of inertia yet, but so basically you want to shrink everything, get that close. Also having your wheelbase small will help you with your turning radius, right? So your turning radius, you imagine if this was really close, your turning radius is nice and small, right? But if you make your wheelbase really big, our radius gets big, right? So if, if you can minimize your wheelbase, you can get your turning radius small, you can get your moment of inertia small, you can get your car light. So some of the downsides with getting your wheelbase too small, one, you have, you have a lot of weight shift forward and back, right? So, so in this case, you'll have more, the, the wheelbase divides this weight, these weight shifts, right? So you, so if you don't want too much weight shift, like when you break, you don't want too much weight shift to the front, then, then you want to increase the wheelbase. The other thing it affects is your straight line stability. So typically as your car gets narrower and narrower and narrower, it, at straight lines, it gets wobbly or quicker. Um, so you also don't want to do that. Um, and then your track width. So basically, so in, in both cases, we find our wheelbase is around like 60 inches. And that's like kind of near the minimum. Mm -hmm. um, so near minimum. And then, and, and then we'll, what about the track width? Same thing. So what you'll find is you'll go from basically like go-karts. So like like which are like, you know, little carts that are basically heavy turning. In those cases, usually your um, track width to your wheelbase is, is on the order of one, right? And you go all the way to basically the opposite end of the spectrum, you'll find the dragsters. Where your track width to wheelbase is, you know, maybe almost greater than like two or 2.5, right? So you get these cars that don't turn at all. They're just all about straight line speed. You get these things crazy long, right? And narrow basically, right? And they got good straight line stability, but you don't need to turn. So you don't care about the track width, right? And then you got like Formula One cars, right? Mix of high speed and low speed. So then you got maybe like maybe like a Formula track, or like a lot of passenger cars. I think are are maybe around here too, where your track width and your wheelbase is um, on the order, maybe like one point seven. 
right? So, and you see, it's basically the more turning you have, you need to get your track width bigger and bigger, almost close to the size of your wheelbase. Kind of a, and that makes your car kind of a square pattern, and that's going to help, and that's going to help you not have so much weight shift, basically. But keep in mind, it does kind of hurt your, it does, um, it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily help you with like the moment of inertia. It kind of spreads your car out a little wider. And that goes all the way to the kind of really long cars, basically, like the dragsters. And so you'll see for us, we're both Baja and Formula. We're both pretty slow, pretty turny courses. We usually sit about in this range. We sit close, clo you know, pretty close to a... Um, uh, oh, sorry. by the way, I've been doing this wrong. You guys gotta, you guys gotta give me crap. This is wheelbase over track width. Okay, because the wheelbase that's this way is really long and the drags are short, right? So this is, so we sit, so we sit about here. We sit close to a square pattern with our wheelbase just slightly longer than our track width. And that's because we're not as maybe as boxy as maybe a kind of a go-kart track, but we're pretty slow. And I would make the argument Baja is slower than formula. Baja should sit closer to a one-to-one -one ratio than necessarily formula should. Formula might should maybe be a little more long and slender type car. Um, what are your, um, the Baja's minimum, like track and wheelbase? What is theirs? Yeah. So they're probably their wheelbase is I think they're they're maybe sixty to fifty-eight. I think you guys are maybe sixty-two to fifty-one or fifty-two, you guys said. Um well the wheelbase minimum is sixty. And then I mean sixty the track minimum, minimum is I hope you guys designed for like sixty one or sixty two. Yeah, we did. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, so you, you give yourself, but anyways, so you can see them. Um, you, you can see what, that. Chris, why did we do, design a car for a longer wheelbase than we had to have? Well, 60 is the minimum. Air. And I wouldn't trust these kids to necessarily, I wouldn't trust myself, including them, to design for 60 and be exactly at 6-0. Because if you mess up and your car is at five nine point nine and you show up to comp, you can't run. So personally, I would tell them give them an I just give them an inch of clearance for mistakes in manufacturing, basically, or mistakes in the frame. Because <laughs> I and they'll add up, right? If you make a half inch in the frame, you know, a half inch in the suspension, a half inch in the upright. I mean, that's a lot. Maybe you would, you yeah. know, you do an inch in the frame, quarter inch in the in the suspension, you know, an eighth of an inch in the upright. You know, all right. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, you're out close to an inch, right? So these things can, these things can kind of add up, right? And you don't know if they're going to do the left side or the right side, right? So it could be just on one side, basically. So I would, I would never have them. I think you're right, Bill. I wouldn't have them overly push it, but I'd, I'd give them an inch of wiggle room at least. Yeah, right. At least that's. I think. Would you say the same, Bill? Probably. Yeah, I mean the guys who. Uh... I, I don't think you'd get in trouble for a tenth of an inch. No. But I think if it was approaching a full inch, you might hear about it. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, when they, so, when you, that, that sounds good. Uh, when you go through comp and they put the car on the tilt test, the tilt table, those cars go up to almost to, to uh, what is it? What's the maximum tilt? 90 degrees? Can't uh, 60? It's supposed to simulate three G's, I think. Because I saw a car go upside down on the tilt table one time. The table, the table failed. And when it got to it got to like 60 degrees, it just kept on going. And actually uh, the, the guy was hanging by his seat belt inside the car, which is ugly. But uh those cars, when they go up to 60 degrees, that those wheels stay right on that table. I've, I've never seen a car tilt tail with tilt table. I think this 12 inch is is higher than what it should. I mean, it, it's probably should be closer to eight, to be honest. Um, you know, so it should be lower, but because you should be able to do this. 
Yeah. How, do you, how, how do you suggest that we lower the, the uh, CG? Don't make a flat frame. Yeah, I mean, I think about the heavy stuff first, right? I mean, get the engine down low. Engine's probably one of the heaviest things. You get the driver's butt down low and you get them leaning back. The driver's probably the next, is probably the heaviest thing. It's probably heavier than the engine. So I think you just get, you focus on getting your, getting your car low to the ground and you get everything else as low as possible in the frame safely as possible. This 12 I just made up. I mean, honestly, we might be fine. We might be eight inches or something. You know, that, we, just, we just threw that as a round number out for these calculations. I would assume our car is, you know, around 10, 10 to 12 probably. But I think 12 is on the high, 12 is on the high side. I think the heaviest component in the car that we have now is the driver. The drivers will be heavier than the engine, right? Uh, yeah, for sure. So when you build the chassis, if you if you set the, the, the front and the rear of the car pretty much wherever you want, but when you get to the back of where the, the driver's seat is, you could drop that thing down within an inch of the track. In fact, the original the original uh, test was to put a, a, a one inch piece of tubing under the car and roll it back and forth and it couldn't touch the car. But now they've done away with that. So as long as you don't touch the ground, like when you go over one of those uh, cables on the, on the road and check the speed, it doesn't matter. So you could go within three quarters of an inch of the ground with, with the chassis and still be perfectly legal. Yeah, no, so I think that's good. So get that thing low. Baja, this is almost a more of an issue for Baja because they need 12 inches of right height. So they need their drivers sitting 12 inches off the ground, right? So that's why the Baja car goes a little bit wider too. Um, uh, some other, what, I wanted to say something else about, something else about this. Um, so, oh yeah, so this is, and this is something how, this is something that we're kind of working on too, is how can we put in our tire data and some basics about the, um, about the car and do lap simulation to try and change the wheelbase and the track width and try different things to see how it actually affects a real lap time basically so that we can go deeper than this kind of hand waviness you know i'd say this is this is you know a not very scientific or engineering or scientific approach to doing this is kind of like the best we got and i think i mean you see that even in even in like uh let's see here so So if you get bored, let's see here. This is a this is a decent book on chassis. I'm reading through some stuff about just chassis for fun. <laughs> You'll notice. Maybe so here's a bunch of old here's a bunch of old 60s race cars, right? And you see, you see here, you know, these are on, these are on the, on the order of the high, just under, just under two. So these are around the 1.7 I was talking about, right? But you can tell, you know, a lot of their stuff about wheelbase and track width, it's based at looking at a lot of other cars that are tweaking them here and there, and kind of, you know, it's even at even at the high levels. I mean, this was in the 60s. I'm sure Formula One, right? It's all this stuff, but you know, it's a lot of this, it's a lot of it's trial and error, you know, go up a little down, little go up, go a little down, see how it's affecting stuff. Right. Um, but um, anyway, so this is a, this is a sports, this is a racing and sports car chassis to dine by Coastin and Coastin and Phipps. So this is one of my favorites, my absolute favorite, which is like everybody's favorite. The first book anybody tells you about is Tune to Win by Carol Smith. That book is just, it's kind of good and to the point. The, the kind of Bible, which will like tell you about everything basically, right, is, is here. So, you know, when me and Enrique, we were having a, we were trying to figure out stuff about, about, um, about what an understeer car would do, right? So you go to this William and Douglas Milliken race car vehicle dynamics. This one's got this one's got everything, but this one's, I mean, you think 
you think I like you think I like complicated equations? I mean, just get into <laughs> just get into this guy's stuff. Can't even understand half the stuff he's talking about. You know, there's so much detail. But this is, I think a lot of students say they use this, in front of them, but I, I think a lot of them just say that to say that so that if people think they know a lot. <laughs> see if see if you can learn as much as you can from this, from this book. But I think, you know, this guy obviously knew way. This guy did not mess around. So. I think it would take a really, it would take a long time to really understand everything that's in this book because it's quite, it's. it's Do quite a page of me and we'll just stare at it. One solid weekend, I think you got it. Yeah, just sleep, just sleep with it under your head, and maybe it'll slowly just. <laughs> <laughs> Can I that's your Bible. <laughs> um, so yeah, and this is also, I mean, I think this is the approach that we should have to designing the car, basically is you start with the wheel, you start with your choice of tires. You know, everything you do on your car has to go through the tires, basically. Besides, I mean, almost even your aero package. Like, the only thing really driving us around these flat courses, like the only forces we haven't talked about are gravity, right? So like a hill climb, we should include gravity. Everything is going through the tires. So your first thing you pick is your tires, and then everything else starts to fall from that, from your tires in. You, basically, you're gonna get your track width, you're gonna get your wheel base, after you get your track width, your base, you're talking about your suspension, right? I think you're, you're based on the rules. You have to know, you know, and to pick your tires, you need some info. You need like, you know, what does the course typically look like? What are the regulations on your, on your power unit, right? So you need some high level design, but I think you're getting some of that first stuff. You get the tires and then you work your way in from, from the shape of the car to the suspension, right? And once you have the suspension, you have all your pickup points, then you go to the chassis, right? And then, um, and then you go into the driver. And so it's, it's kind of the design of a car is kind of weird in that a lot of time it's like an inside out design, right? But no, everything in your car goes through the tires. That forces it to be kind of an outside in design on the car. Um, so, and if there's no questions, that's kind of, so I think we covered, we kind of covered forward and back stuff last time. Then today we try, I tried to cover kind of cornering basically kind of, the basics of kind of what to do and what to do in turns. Um, uh, I also inside the our notes is also the handbook, right, which has you know better diagrams of some of this stuff, and it has all these plots, um, right? Oh, there's one other thing I should mention this. So, so that grip, this is actually really important. So that grip makes something what we call our traction circle so oh, yeah. let's say in a turn so here you're coming into a turn you're decelerating and then you're slowly having an acceleration to the right as you're cornering and then you come out of your come out of your turn basically right so you can only make this 1.5 g's that's that normalized value it makes a circle so you can only either corner or go forward at that but you can't come up here into the top right and go forward and turn on that combined so a good driver, basically, as they go through turns, they should basically be sitting on this traction circle. So they should be braking fully as much as they can on their traction circle at this, you know, and our case should be like negative. So this is back in the days from tune to win, but now our tires are doing double this almost. So you should be braking at like minus three Gs. In the right-hand turn, you should be getting up to, you know, three Gs turning to the right and you should be sitting down and accelerating out of the turn. So basically a good driver should be sitting, should be sitting on, this, on this traction circle at all times, basically. So if you plotted this data for a driver, you could really tell, you know, are they driving the car to the limit on this track or not, basically. And here's probable, and here's more of like classic. So you kind of, you slow down and then you just take the turn. But so the traction circle is an important thing to combination for Forward and back is acceleration and braking, and left to right is right cornering, left cornering. And you can only accelerate in a vector inside this circle, basically. You know, um, so the so the 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 traction circle is a is a is a kind of a concept of a combining the combining both the forward and back acceleration and the left and right acceleration. And we can see an R. In our tires, so this is longitudinal, is like 3.3, 3. and lateral, we're 
at like 2.8. So we can actually accelerate more forward and back than we can left and right. So in our case, this is like, you know, forward and back is around, is around like 3.5 G and left and right is around 2.8. So our traction circle is more of a traction oval. Um, but basically you want to stick on the outer edge of this at all times, basically. You want to be, you know, uh, not wasting any of your traction circle. You want to be putting your tires on their outer, on their, on the, all, as much grip as possible. And the only time you maybe won't be doing this is if you're, is if you're propulsion limited in like a straightaway, right? So it's only at these really high speeds where you're, you're propulsion limited that you don't do this. Um, so, and then I talked about the temps. Here's some interesting data. So I, I took all of our, I took all of the data for both putting our tires, which are seven and a half inch wide on seven inch rims versus eight inch rims. So you can put tires on smaller rims actually. And what you see is that turning wise, if you put them on a narrow rim, you get a boost on your lateral force compared to if you put your tires on a wide rim, right? The wide rim basically stretches your tire out, makes it flat. But on the wide rim, you get a little boost because we're at, I'm looking at 200 because that's the downforce on our cars roughly. You get a little boost. Uh, you get a little boost in forward and back. But to be honest, I don't know. This might just be within error, margins of error. So it might just be, doesn't make a big difference to go to seven inch rims versus eight inch rims for our tire. And this is the width of our rims basically. So what about the, um, like, um, I've seen some rims where they're just super skinny. I mean, some tires that are super skinny versus ours. I'm not too sure the size, but they look like these tiny little tires that people run. Or I don't know if it's like a smaller diameter. Yeah, I mean, it's smaller diameter. But when you go to the smaller diameter tires, you run with packaging issues, right? You got to fit You got to fit your your drive shaft through it. You got to fit your brakes in there, right? So it's already hard enough to get those 10 inch rims. But uh, that the good teams do that, right? So we can talk a little bit more about this, but the, um, I mean, the parts that rotate on your car, they actually weigh double or more. So, so for example, your tires, if you can take five pounds off your tires, that's in effect taking 10 pounds off your car, because not only do you have to accelerate them in a straight line, but you need to spin them up as you accelerate. So if you can take five pounds out of your tire, that's double 10 pounds out of your car. So a lighter tire, any pound you pull out is double worth. So that's why going to small tires is big, but you need to make sure you can get the traction you need with that small tire and you need to be able to package inside of it. So that's, I think that's why you see the best teams. If you can get, you know, lighter and lighter and you don't need, you know, you don't need to be holding 250 pounds force, you know, then you could do that. And if you can package inside of it, but that's, but that's definitely, that's definitely tough. But I think you see teams going to smaller wheels because they're so grippy now that for our weights of our car, we don't need the tires that are that, that are that big, basically. Um, I mean, that's why like a go-kart, right? You don't see like these huge tires on a go-kart. It doesn't help, right? It's got these little tiny tires, right? There's not that much, there's not that much weight. You don't need these big, big tires to get those, those type of grips. Um, so... So I think uh, unless there's any more kind of questions about stuff, I'll end that today. And then next Tuesday we'll start up and we're going to start talking about, we're going to start talking about suspension design, a little bit about suspension. roll centers, yes. about instant centers, um, about how those should move, how those should move with the car. Um, mm -hmm. Where should those, where should those be compared to uh, your CG and that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, so. So I could make one of these for Baja, right? Baja might be 12 or 10 horsepower, right? Their weight is uh, about 500 pounds force. <coughs> and this is about the same. The rolling resistance is gonna be higher though. So their traction limited area though is about one. Hmm. 
So you can see how this changes for like a Baja car. So you see like the drag on a Baja car, like almost never really matters, right? So that's <laughs> why, why we don't put aero packages on a Baja car, right? But you see that they're, because they're so power limited, they, they reach their, they becomes propulsion limited at like six, seven miles per hour, right? And the rolling resistance is so much higher just because they have these big deforming wheels, you know, they don't have small little stiff wheels. Um, you see, this is pretty much dominant. It's the dominant thing they're fighting basically the whole time if they're not accelerating. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so that's, um, that's a, you know, so if you guys, you can take, you know, so these worksheets, they, they're, they're super general, right? You can just take them and modify them if you want. But I mean, these things only take me 10, 15 minutes to make, right? So that's, that's one reason to get good at Excel is you can, can pencil out a lot of things and learn a lot of things using them. And this is like using Excel's almost base functionality, not even using any optimizers in Excel. So if you watch like the FEA workshop from Kevin Narr, he talks about optimizing stuff, right? So, um, so that he even shows you how to do it in that video. So if you get, if you get interested with that, it's kind of a quick and dirty tool. I use it instead of MATLAB for a lot of stuff like that. An Excel, you said, right? Say that again? You're talking about an, ex an Excel, right? Mm -hmm. They have like little optimizers where like, if like I could optimize, I could optimize one of these parameters based on other parameters, basically. Right. So like he'll basically, he'll try and optimize the size, the dimensions of his part, basically, um, on his FEA. So he, he shows some of that stuff in his, I mean, he has FEA video, his FEA demo was really, really good. We need to bother Sergio to finish all the nice videos. You don't need to make them so nice, though. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'll, I'll get on it. I'll get on it. <laughs> wait, I know how long what, nine hours? <laughs> then you spend so many hours editing those. Yeah. So, it's like, too so, long. so, so, but the whole thing's up, actually. You don't need to wait for Sergio. Sergio's just look super nice. But the video, the whole video is up on our Baja, on our Baja YouTube page.